Good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'll tell you about my work today, which takes a lot of the insights that I've gained from a many decade career in AI and applies us to the area of biology and medicine. So first, a word from our general counsel, and now to the meat of the talk. So um, the, the area of drug discovery is an interesting tale of the glass half full and the glass half empty. The glass half full is exemplified on this slide with incredible medical advances that have happened in the last half century and beyond, where diseases that used to have no meaningful treatments and far from a cure now have, uh, now have been reduced by modern medicine to a chronic disease or sometimes even a cure. Vaccines, of course, are in everyone's minds these days, but there's many other diseases where this has happened. So I'm not going to outline everything that's on this slide, but maybe just highlight um, genetically targeted therapies, of which the one important example is the set of uh, medications for cystic fibrosis that have turned something that was a death sentence at the age of 20 to a manageable chronic disease by understanding the specific genetic lesions that patients with cystic fibrosis have. That's the glass half full. The glass half empty is what's come to be known as Eroom's Law. Everyone in this room, of course, has been writing the tidal wave of Moore's Law. Eroom is the inverse of Moore, and it is the exponential decrease in productivity of pharmaceutical R&D for the past 50 years or more. You'll notice that the y-axis is on a logarithmic scale, and it's the number of approved drugs per uh, billion dollars of spending, and you can see that that uh, graph has been growing, has been decreasing exponentially year on year, and the reason for that is that the R&D success rate is about 5, maybe 7 percent, depending on how you count, which means that every approved drug has to carry on its back um, the cost of all of the failures. Now, there's no other industry in which we tolerate a 95 percent failure rate. So what is it that makes drug discovery so hard? Drug discovery is usually a 10 to 15 year journey with many forks in the road. What how do we define the disease? What are the targets that we go after? What's the right patient population? What symptom are we trying to alleviate? Um, what target do we select? All of those are decisions that we have to make. Each of those has many, many wrong paths, and if we're lucky, one that leads us to success. Um, knowing which one to take is a uh, form of black magic at this point, based on historical heuristics, model systems that we know are flawed, like animal models, and oftentimes we take the wrong path, leading us to a multi-year um, uh, dead end that can um, be very costly and often lead to the failure of the program as a whole. So how can we make better predictions? How can we decide more frequently in, men in each of those junctures which is the right path to take? So the goal of what we do at Incitro is to try and apply machine learning towards that goal. Have the right kind of data and the right kind of machine learning models that can help improve our ability to predict what is the right path, um, increasing the overall probability of success of drug discovery and hopefully also shortening the process and making it less costly. So the fundamental challenge is that biology is really, really complicated. And our current way of, def of understanding biology and certainly of defining human disease is oftentimes um, something that, based on methods that were developed 50 or 70 years ago, coarse-grained symptomatic manifestations that have very little to do with the underlying biology that drives the disease, giving rise to a situation where multiple distinct biological processes that happen to manifest in a fairly coarse-grained clinical manifestation are given the same name, and then we try and take one drug and apply it to what are effectively very different diseases and are surprised that we don't see statistically significant improvements in the broad patient population. So the idea is that with new techniques for measuring biology and new machine learning methods for interpreting the data that we see, perhaps we can come up with a more actionable taxonomy of human disease and human biology and come up with better intervenable nodes um, for, um, for actually in intervening in, in patient um, state. <laughs> 
So, um, so the idea that we are employing here is that we are now finally in a world where we can actually measure human biology in a much more quantitative and high content way than we could ever before. And those measurements come in two different forms. Um, they come from in vivo measurements of what in vivo means in a human, in, a, in an organism, uh, measurements of human biology ranging from histopathology to brain MRI, electrocardiograms, various blood biomarkers, transcriptome proteomics and so on, all of which provide us with a very high resolution, high content picture of human biology. The challenge with human biology is that you cannot intervene in a human until the very end of the process called a clinical trial. And so in order to create an intervenable system that allows us to interrogate the causality of human disease, we also supplement that with in vitro systems. In vitro means in a lab dish, uh, where we take um, cellular systems that are actually derived from a human. And at this point, we can take a cell from any one of you, turn it into what's called a pluripotent stem cell, and create a neuron with your genetics or a hepatocyte with your genetics to see what your individual genetic burden of disease looks like in an in vitro system, in, in one of those cell types. And we're able to measure those cells at unprecedented fidelity and scale and similarly understand what disease looks like at the cellular level. So that, of course, generates masses of data that machine learning is the only tool that can help us interpret what we see and make that actionable. So with that interpretation of the underlying biology, we can align it with clinical outcomes on the one hand, with genetics on the other, and really bridge the gap between human genetics and the genetic causes of disease to disease state. So the platform that we've been building at Incitro for close to four years now is really something that takes all of that and puts it together. Um, measurements, high content measurements from human biology, from cellular biology, aligned with clinical outcomes and genetics. Now, in order to build such a company, you can't just sort of layer a little bit of machine learning on top of an existing biopharma. You have to actually build a data-enabled company from the ground up. And we've built machine learning data-enabled workflow from everything, including the robots that operate in our lab, um, to the pipelines that process, take the data off the instrument, process it, put it into the cloud through the machine learning that interprets the data. We've made some of those tools open source. I encourage you to try them. Uh, really one of the most uh, interesting workflow engines out there was something that we open sourced a few months ago. I'm going to very quickly give you a quick vignette of one of the projects that we have. It's the one that's furthest along, which is why I selected that one. We have multiple others um, in other areas, such as neuroscience, which we're particularly passionate about. But this is a disease called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. It's called NASH. Um, it's actually an unfortunately very common disease because it is a fatty liver disease that is driven by Western diet, metabolic syndrome, obesity, type 2 diabetes. The, the prevalence of NAFLD fatty liver is now about a quarter of the world's population and growing. And when NAFLD progresses, what happens is the hepatocytes suck up these, um, these lipid droplets, they become inflamed, um, and they, their, the liver becomes scarred, leading eventually to liver cirrhosis and um, hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, so it's a pretty nasty disease. Um, when we worked on this uh, with our partners at Gilead, uh, we had access to a really interesting data set that had a lot of interesting clinical data associated with it, specifically a lot of clinical data taken from these disease livers at the beginning and end of the clinical trial. One of those was um, histopathology images that we were um, able to interpret using machine learning, and we developed a set of unsupervised approaches that allowed us to learn the language of these, um, of these histopathologies pathological images in a way that far transcended, as I'll show you, what the pathologist was able to do looking at those same images. So a pathologist looking at those images basically gives them very coarse-grained ordinal scores going from zero to six across four dimensions, fibrosis, um, inflammation, and so on. Um, and it turned out that those, while pretty good, the pathologist they had was very good, were very um, captured relatively a small portion of the signal inside those histopathological images. So with our weekly supervised learning, we were able to, first of all, which, in, which involved no training on the clinician scores, we were able to, first of all, um, create a much finer-grained notion of the pathologist scores that um, captured finer-grained gradations within the, uh, the fibrosis, for example, allowing us to much better predict which patients are likely to progress and which ones are not, much more so than the coarse-grained pathologist scores were able to do.
But maybe more interesting, those provided better ability to align and predict molecular data that speaks to the underlying biological processes in the disease. So in this case, we actually had both genetics as well as RNA sequencing, transcriptional expression data from those patients. And we were able to predict, for example, just by looking at the histopathology sample, what the patient's expression profile was for a much larger subset of genes than the pathologist scores were. And you can see um, the graph on the right really shows that uh, the Pearson correlation was much, much higher in our, uh, when user, using our embedding. This graph demonstrates that in an even more visual way, showing that for the vast majority of genes, all of the dots that are on the sort of above that diagonal line are ones that are much better predicted using the embedding scores than the um, pathologist scores. And what was maybe even more exciting yet is that known genetic drivers of the disease that were completely insignificant in terms of their association to what the pathologist was looking for in the image, in this case actually had a very clear and beautiful what's called dose response. The more disease uh, genes or versions of the gene you have, the stronger um, the phenotype that you see, um, rec allowing us to replicate known biological drivers of the disease and use the same methods to uncover novel ones that were completely invisible when you looked at the pathologist scores alone. Um, okay. So I mentioned in the beginning of the talk that we're working both with human clinical data as well as with data produced in our lab. I didn't uh, present, because it's a short talk here today, um, a video of our automated lab that basically does these kinds of cellular experiments using robots, moving cells from one dish to another, and so on. But I am going to show you one really cool machine learning-enabled microscope that we have built that allows you to do closed-loop lab experimentation. So this is a microscope that basically shines light into cells at different angles over time. You can see the red LEDs kind of cycling through different angles. Now, the nice thing about cells is that they're semi-transparent and that depending on the way in which the light hits the cells, they refract at different angles. The light refracts at different angles. And so you could actually start to infer from the angle at which the light refracts what the, what the light is hitting. Is it part of the cell membrane? Is it the nucleus? Is it uh, lipid particles that you can see in the cells? And so effectively, what you see there is actually live cell imaging that provides you a very detailed high contrast, high resolution view of cells in action by cycling through these lights. Now, a human eye can't make sense of this. It looks like one big blur, but we have two layers of machine learning interpretation. One that takes those different um, measurements on the circulating basis and reconstructs this high resolution image. And the other hallucinates cellular markers that you can see on the top right hand side of the graph that tells you what those, um, what that's actually being seen, where are the lipid droplets, where's the nucleus and so on. And it turns out that with completely unsupervised learning, you could actually find really, um, first of all, you can get really good predictions relative to much more complicated and uh, finicky protocols that force you to kill the cells in the middle of the experiment and stain them. And you can see that there's effectively no difference between our hallucinated stains and the real stains, except that we don't have to fix and kill the cells in order to get this data. Um, and we can also start to then layer on different types of interpretation on top of these live cell images, including, for example, which cells are more Nash-like than other cells. In this case, we had a separate ground truth that the algorithm didn't get to see, and you can see that there's this beautiful dose response that the, more, that the algorithm's picking up on this really important signal without being told what it is. So um, this is just an example, one, ex one illustration of the work that we've done in NASH. We're doing a lot of work, for example, in neuroscience, where uh, the unmet need in neurodegeneration is, is fundamental. There's no disease-modifying treatments for pretty much any neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, we have a lot of um, work on neurons that are derived from individual patients, allowing us to do this kind of measurement with this type of approach. Um, so maybe now that's taking a step back along two dimensions. First of all, this is what we aim to do. We aim, as does many biopharma, to discover and develop transformative medicines that help patients in need, but we don't want to just do it once or twice. We want to, first of all, do it differently by de-risking and accelerating the R&D process through the development of these data-driven predictive models that are based on machine learning and generating data that's fit to purpose for machine learning at unprecedented fidelity and scale.
And then, in the same way that machine learning has been able to do in other domains, we, are able, we want to build a data-enabled flywheel so that the predictions, as you feed the machine more images of neurons, more transcriptional profiles from patients, keeps getting better and better over time. So maybe just to wrap up in the last um, 30 seconds, why am I doing this relative to all the many other things that machine learning people can do these days? I think we're entering an era that is really interesting and unique, which is the convergence of two disciplines that have largely been separate up to now. There is the era of quantitative biology, which has given us human genetics and the ability to interrogate human biology at this unprecedented fidelity and scale using tools such as CRISPR, these pluripotent stem cells, and many, many, these microscopes that are built, and many others. And on the other, there is the field of data science machine learning, which most of us here are part of. These are two disciplines that have been largely proceeding in parallel with relatively little convergence. And what the era that I think is the next discipline of science is the era of digital biology, where we're able to measure biology with this unprecedented fidelity and scale, interpret what we're seeing through the lens of machine learning, and then take that back into engineering biological systems to behave differently than they otherwise would, with ramifications, in this case, to human health, but I think similar ramifications in agriculture, in the environment, in biomaterials, and many more. So it's a really exciting space, and hopefully some of you will find it interesting enough to be part of it as well. Thank you very much.